I would probably lose the first ever comedian to appear on Jimmy Fallon. Like, that's some great credit. <laughs> it didn't even go well. <laughs> it didn't even... It didn't? They came into the office, we'd been in the show for like a week or two, and they were like, would you, how much time do you need to get ready to do stand-up on the show? And I was like, I'd love a couple nights, you know, be able to run into the cellar or something. They're like, what if it's tonight? <laughs> and I knew that my friend Nick Thune had just gotten booked for the week after, and he was bragging that he was going to be the first one on, and I was like, <laughs> I'm cool, I'll do it tonight. <laughs> And they wrote, since I couldn't practice it, they wrote my set list on a note card, like a, like a big white note card in dark blue lettering. And I walk out onto the stage, and I cannot see a word of it. Like, it's just in the dark. Then I'm like, let's see if I get into trouble for what I say. <laughs> so I'll show you a special, which I is... I hope so. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing. It's great. Thank it's you. It's so funny and so, like, um, you know, it's just precise in a way that uh, a lot of things aren't today. So yeah, I, I found that with uh, the way you know Netflix and everything, that people keep, can do more comedy specials than ever, that you kind of just have to go up there and talk for an hour if right. you want, and you get the same amount of money as if you like really <laughs> focused. That I was like, I'm just going to make this, I'm gonna work harder than people usually do. I'm gonna take three years as opposed to one or two. Right, and doing a lot of one-liners, uh, I don't know if that's a, uh, but I mean, w doing one-liners is a different, it's a, it's a very difficult thing because you have to live and die on each joke. Mm -hmm. And that's what really is impressive too about the special is it's all one line, you know, like there's a school of, of comedy which one-liners is maybe the purest form in a certain way, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think so because it just has to work on a comedic level. You can be telling a story that's not that funny, but it's very interesting and heartfelt, right. and you're like, oh, wow, Hannah Gadsby's amazing. Um, or, <laughs> or you can like have these jokes that, like, even if you don't want to laugh, you have to because right. the twist is so good. Yes, speaking of which, one of my favorites is you said, you don't mind me giving them away. I don't want to say it wrong, so I'll ask you to please tell them the story about the first time you saw your father's penis, because I don't like to ruin the joke <laughs> with my interpretation. I so, um, I'll never forget the first time, or I'll never forget the one time I saw my dad's penis. I said, uh, Dad, don't text me shit like that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So that's a great, great joke, because it's one of those things where you, me and most people can't be shocked today. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something that's a shocking thing, but only because it's so funny. So it's like, I'm almost, it's more shocking that you manage to, a lot of your jokes, like the uh, white supremacist stuff and all that stuff, it's more shocking that you're like, oh, where are you gonna go with this that's gonna make it so funny, not just over the top. Like there's a fine line between shock humor, which is, can be, you know, just pandering. Yes. And what you're doing. Yes, it's I agree. Different. I mean, I'm trying to get the audience to go one way and then I go the other. Right. And so I love that comedians will come up with their own punchlines that also work. They think right. I know where this is going and then I even get them to miss. Right. But that's the highest compliment I can get. Well, that's not what I said, but you made it into <laughs> Somehow I'm this idiot that's like, I see where he's going, Marge. And then, oh, he really tricked me. Listen. One Let's time, start back at the beginning. Go ahead. Once I'm at the cellar, one of the best com uh, compliments I ever got uh, was from Louis C.K. Uh, years ago. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I come off stage, and he's like, I love watching you because I try to guess your punchline, and I come up with my own that right. works, but it's different from yours. He's like, do you mind if I go on stage and do some of those? And I was like, it would be an honor, please. So I go up and I watch, and he does three of my jokes, my setups with his punchline. Not as good, but still it, it works. And I'm like, that was really funny, Louis. Uh, thank you. Right. I see him six months later at the Aspen Comedy Festival, and he's doing the fucking jokes. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so let's start. I like to start at the beginning. So you're a little kid. You grew up in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So you're in Pittsburgh in this city, which is known as you know, it's still basically 1984 there. It's a very like you go there, it's everybody loves football, but Pittsburgh, it's a, it's it's a real. There's old ladies reading the Steelers Digest. Mm -hmm. You, when I go there, you make jokes about like guys from the 70s. The whole crowd, little kids laugh. Like everybody's just obsessed with the Steelers. 
They don't even care about the Pirates. They care only about the Steelers. Yeah. And uh, so you grow up in this kind of like very jock community. And you've got this, let's say, arch personality. Sure. You know what I mean? Did you get in a lot of fights because of that as a kid? We uh, always yes. This? Yes. I got, I got beaten up a lot. I didn't get in a lot of fights. I got beaten up a lot <laughs> because I was friends with the jocks, but I was the mouthy one. Right. So I would mouth off to someone thinking, these guys have my back. <laughs> and they would be like, we want to watch Anthony fight this guy. <laughs> and uh, I would lose. Yeah. And were you like, um, were you, do, do, I always I think about when I was a kid, like being, like being the class clown, but I was very uh, obnoxious. Like a lot of people hated me too. And a lot of teachers hated me. Were you the kind of kid, like, did you feel like, that you were getting a lot of negative response to when you were being funny? Like a lot of people love somebody who messes up this whole school order, but did you feel like a lot of negative reactions too? Like were you that guy? I, were you quiet or were you just? I, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Uh, if I ever thought of a joke, I had to say it no matter what was going on in class. Right. And teachers either really loved me for it or hated me for it, right. depending on the class. Yeah. Chemistry didn't go over so well. <laughs> You know, lit class, they, would, they, would, uh, they were more open to it. But I found, and I think this is almost like a, a founding principle of my comedy today even, that if you can make the teacher laugh, you could not get in trouble. Mm -hmm. No matter how disruptive you were, if the teacher cracked a smile, they couldn't send you out of the room. Right. You know, and I realized that very quickly, that try to make the joke a little smarter, and, uh, and you can't get into trouble. Yeah, well, that's one thing. It is so smart, this special. It's really, you know, like you say, you take places. So you start, when did you start comedy? Like after, when did you decide you wanted to be a comedian? I was probably about 23 years old. I had moved to Los Angeles and I always loved stand-up. I loved all stand-up, it didn't matter. I had my favorites, but I would watch anyone. And it never occurred to me, being a kid from Pittsburgh, that you could do it. You know, I knew Dennis Miller was from Pittsburgh. I didn't know about Billy Gardell yet, but I knew that uh, there were people who would come out of it, but my dad was an attorney, my mom was a housewife. It was like I was either going to be an attorney or maybe a journalist. I, I liked writing, I liked books. And uh, after college, I went, I went to college in New Orleans, and then I went out to LA, and I was just kind of bumming around trying to figure it out. And um, I, I decided, like, if I could do anything, what would I want to do? And I thought being a late night writer sounded fun. You're on a table with 12 other guys throwing out jokes all day, what could be more fun than that? I imagine kind of what the comedy cellar table is now. I imagine that's what it was like, and I was dead wrong. But uh, Jimmy Brogan, do you know Jimmy Brogan? Sure. Jimmy Brogan went to college with my father at Notre Dame, was the one connection my dad had for me. I met with him, and I thought he was just going to give me a job writing for The Tonight Show. But he said, do stand-up. It'll help get your voice out there. Right. And so I got into stand-up strictly to get a, a job writing in late night. And by the time I finally got the job, I was six or seven years into stand-up, and I liked, it, uh, I liked it that much more. Hey, okay. do you, I don't know if you remember this. I, 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 I moved to New York. I, pa I get passed at the Comedy Cellar, so I'm one of the First guys. First of all, before you say that, so you're doing it in L.A., and why did you realize you had to move to New York? I was dating someone oh, who okay. I broke up with who was vengeful. <laughs> and, uh, and I was not getting booked on many shows anymore uh, because they would be like, I'll do your flyer and do your website for your show, but you can't book Anthony. And they all said, fine. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm gonna go to New York. It's, so, that's so you moved fun. to New York, you passed the cellar, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what the cellar was at the time. I thought it was just another club. Right. And then after I got in there, I realized, like the movie Comedian with Jerry Seinfeld, which you're a big part of, right. was one of the things that really informed my comedy and my work ethic. That I'm like, I'm re-watching it, and I'm like, oh my God, this is all taking place at the Comedy Cellar. If I had known, I would have been so nervous. Right. But I just walked in and just had a good set. Um, but about a, two weeks later, uh, I get the job on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon as a monologue writer, and I'm, I'm walking, I'm bragging to everyone, and they're like, it's too bad you could have been a great comedian. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I'm, I'm still going to keep doing this, and they're like, no, no one does. Everyone gets the writing job, and you never see him again. And I said, well, what about Colin Quinn and Dave Attell? And they go, they're different. They're a different type of, like, breed of comedian. You're not like that. <laughs> so I went to both you and Dave Attell separately. And I said, how did you keep on doing stand-up while you had a job uh, writing? And you both gave me the exact same answer. You said, uh, it was easy. I was really bad at my job. <laughs> and so I was like, got it. So every <laughs> night, 
every night, no matter what happened at work, I still went to the cellar and did a set and had a drink and then went home. And the next day I'd be tired at work and cranky when I should have just gone to bed and taken care of myself. Right. I was still doing stand-up every night until I quit that job. Yeah, and but that was the right move. And also, uh, the problem with writing at a job is when you come up with something really funny, you're like, I'm ducking that for myself. I'm not going to give that to them. You know, it never came up. People kept saying, are there jokes you write for the show? I don't really have any topical things in my right. act. But it never came up that I was like, ooh, this is better for me. You know, there were jokes that Jimmy would say, I can't tell that. It'll make people hate me. Right. But even still, I would never have used it in my act. But I know for that year, I never wrote uh, a new joke. I just kept doing the same stuff I was doing, but I was making sure I kept the muscle going. And then after I left the job, uh, eventually I started to be able to write my own material again. Because monologue is a completely different art form than stand-up. Yeah, yeah. Now, your type of stand-up, do you feel like if, because I remember seeing you probably 10 years ago, maybe 11 years, you opened for me. You and Amy Schumer opened for me in Caroline's. Glad you remembered. Anyway, no, it goes I, like this. It goes, I thought it was a big break for you guys at the time. <laughs> maybe it was 12 years, but it happened. You look it up. Um, but I remember, I mean, I remember you had a very distinctive style, because stand-up, being funny is one thing, but being distinctive is another. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like you're, you're, per, you're not doing a character. I feel like it's, I feel like everybody who does stand up, it's a heightened way of the way you are. Yes. So like when you're on stage, you're not doing a character. No. But when you're, you're special, I feel like one of the great things about your special is that you're breaking in the middle of all the jokes and in the middle of all this stuff, this, these thoughts you're breaking in the audience going, now that's a setup. Like you have all these moments where you're kind of being, you know, like breaking into yourself completely and just like saying, hey, and I feel like that's an interesting, like you never saw, like all the great one-liner people never did that. No, uh, Rodney Dangerfield would sometimes do a bunch of jokes in a row and then go, I got a lot of fucking jokes, all right? Right. And I always thought that was great. But yes. people tell me, they'll be like, Anthony, would you just smile more? When you smile, the audience gets it that you're joking. And I'm like, no. I like it when, I'm never laughing at my joke or what I've done. I'm laughing at the audience's reaction to it. I think right. it's funny they're laughing at these things. Right. But if I forced it, it would be inauthentic. Of course it would and be. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to be like, you broke me to smile and let you know right. a little bit behind and the curtain. And it would also ruin the whole idea of mm -hmm. if you smile too much. Yeah. I mean, then it goes against, the, it's almost like, hey, I'm kidding with this stuff. Yeah. But you're not kidding. No, I like a little bit of mystique there, though. Like, is he really like this? Right. When John Mulaney says when he watches me, he watches the audience because he thinks it's funny that I reset them for each joke. I'll tell that story about my dad seeing his penis, and they, everyone laughs, and I'm like, my uncle, and they're like, your uncle, yes. Like, as if, like, I'm telling a real story all of a sudden. You're like, you know there's a punchline coming. Like, you, you, right. you bought tickets. Right, but it's also like you see the world in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And you feel, I feel like you're... Your act is, like everybody's act, it's saying something beyond what the jokes are. You're also saying like that you just think, you think all these, you think that it's like, defi it's almost defiant, in, I, especially in today. I, Maybe 10 years ago you wouldn't have said that, but it's a defiance to your, to your energy up there. You know? I think it's strange what people think you can and cannot talk about in a comedic setting. Like people don't get mad at my jokes, they get mad that people are laughing at my jokes. You know, uh, so I, and I just think it's I think it's hypocritical that I just want to do uh, do what I can, and I, I think that with the, the increase in political correctness uh, in this country, it's only benefited me. You know, a lot right. of comics have complained about it, but I think this is great. Um, <laughs> I couldn't do what I do without it. Yeah, and it's the pride you take in twi taking the twist and making it funny to it. It's involuntary laughter. Yes. Which is a lot of what comedy has to be. Yes. Like so. I, have a, I have an Alzheimer's joke in my new special. And when I say the word Alzheimer's, the entire audience gets silent. Even if they know a joke is coming, they get so quiet because of the weight that word carries. And I'm so proud that the joke itself is good enough to get everyone to laugh. It's one of the, the biggest laughs I get in the whole special. But it is the, the biggest moment of tension as well. And do you do a lot of like, you don't do any kind of colleges or any kind of I can't see you doing corporate gigs without getting in a lot of trouble. No corporate gigs. I once did a private birthday party 
where I remember I ran, up to, I ran, up, uh, I ran into you afterwards and commiserated about how awful it had gone. It was, I mean, it was one of the worst 15 minutes of my life. Um, corporates, corporations would never use me. Colleges, people to complain about colleges being too PC, they flat out can't afford me. <laughs> I love doing colleges and seeing what works and what doesn't, but, uh, you know. And, <laughs> and have you ever done Europe or any of these uh, types of environments? I did. I did it on this last tour. I did a whole European section. And it was interesting because in all of these countries, even if they weren't English-speaking countries, they understood English better than they could speak it. So they could watch a, mo in a, a movie in English and understand everything. That they got jokes that were almost too smart for American audiences to get, even though it's in their language. That they laughed at everything and really appreciated that I was there. That I never had any kind of uh, translation problem or any, any issues. Yeah, and when you're on stage, you seem like a Scandinavian personality. <laughs> I, when I had a Comedy Central show in 2013, uh, someone came to me from the network and they're like, we can see where people Google you all over the world. It's obviously the most in America, Canada, little Mexico, and then a distant, like a, a, a near third or fourth is Poland. And I was like, why Poland? And they're like, they think you're Polish. Like, they love you there. So I'm like, I'm gonna book a, I'm gonna book a tour date in Warsaw. And they're like, no one goes to Warsaw. No, one, no American comedian has ever performed here. I'm like, I'm going, because they're going to go, they're going to meet me at the airport <laughs> and <laughs> carry me to the stage. And then I got there, and they were like, why would we think you're Polish? Like, whoever told me that lied. Where it was like a show for 300 people, and they loved it, but it was not, uh, I was not one of them. No, yeah. maybe because you're from Pittsburgh. A lot of Polish people from Pittsburgh. I think that might be part of it. Yeah. But it's, Jeselnik is a Slovenian name, so I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. And now, fucking pull off. <laughs> <laughs> and now, do you think? Have you? Do you feel like now? So you do this special. Now, what are you gonna do? You have to write a new special. You have to write a new because you craft these things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's certain. I keep bringing up the one line of people, but it is a certain thing where you, you can't. Like you said, you can't just run on sentence. It has to be precise. Joke, joke, joke. So now. Do you feel like you're gonna, do you feel pressure to do it again and make it more transgressive? Or do you just feel like it has to be deeper into you, the next special? Uh, it's a great question, and I, I kind of have to write my way through it. You know, I, right. I, I don't have a goal of that I want to make this more transgressive. I just know that after four hours of this, people are getting better and better at guessing the punchline. So I have to be better at hiding it which means the story might have to be a little bit longer. I have to go in a different direction. Uh, but the audience lets me know. A lot of times I'll write a joke and think, this, I fucking nailed it. And then I go out and try it, and the audience is like, no, you did not. <laughs> um, so it, it's trial and error. The biggest problem with one-liners is that once you've heard it, you've heard it. You know, I don't have a Jim Gaffigan's Hot Pockets where right. people want to hear me come out and, and do the whole story right, right, right. right away. And I don't like half old, half new. It's all got to be new. So I really have to uh, form it in L.A. or New York and then take it on the road uh, as a whole. Oh, you don't like half old, half new, huh? No. I, it just, I, it's the one guy in the back being like, I've heard that one. He's doing old yeah. stuff. That drives me crazy, and it should not. You know, yeah. There are a lot of comics who are like, I do the same act wherever I go. People keep coming back. They don't complain. Why would I care? I care very much. Right. Well, that's how you act. Is it's very, like I say, you're a very precise person. You're almost a militaristic type of comedian. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's almost like watching the general up there in some way. I just like the economy of words uh, yeah. to make the perfect joke. You know, that's I'm always how, searching yeah. for that. Uh, you know, I don't want to waste anyone's time. People say, oh, that joke you have is so funny. It's only 30 seconds. You can make it into a five-minute story. Right. Why would I ruin it? You know, right. why not just make it this perfect, like, you couldn't take out a word or add a word and have it get, and get the same response. I like, uh, I like that perfection. And did you, yeah, well, it's, it's comedy when it's, you know, distilled down to its purest form, it's set up in punchline, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you, you don't know Ronnie Shakes or any of these guys from when I was... No, Ronnie Shakes. No. Ronnie Shakes, these are all like one-liner guys back in Cash Rising Star in the 80s, that was like the place. And they were really, they were all one-liner people, but there was a specific group of people, and they had great one-liners that uh, you could probably use as your new act if you want to do Please. half in, half out. Please. But Ronnie Shakes had a joke one time. He goes, he goes, I uh, tried to commit suicide once. I walked into the ocean and drowned myself. I don't know how serious I was. I brought a towel. <laughs> and like, 
He had a bunch of, like, he was the big one-liner guy. Yeah. I mean, Steve Wright was, was did Steve Wright a big influence on Steve Wright was huge for me. Uh, but I, you could, you could when, you, when I started, I'm at open mics in Los Angeles, and you, you could see the guy who was doing Stephen Wright. You could right. see the guy who was doing Mitch Hedberg, and you're like, good luck with that. Right. He's already one of those guys. The thing that helped me was the person I decided to rip off the most was Jack Handy, uh, who wrote for <sighs> SNL, Deep of Thoughts. Of course. Those, to me, were the funniest things in the world, that I would read his books and then write my own. And so people were confused. They couldn't say you're Stephen Wright or you're Jack Handy. There's a little bit, or, or you're uh, Mitch uh, Hedberg. There's some of that in there. Yes. But I stole from a writer. That's great, yeah, yeah. Jack Handy. Mm -hmm. I mean, technically, he was a TV performer. Let's not, you know. He's uh, suddenly acting like you stole from. There's William one picture Blake. in the world that exists of him. He's never once been on camera. I know Jack Handy very well, or at least sort of well. And, uh, <laughs> but he, I mean, I worked with him, and he was, yeah, uh, he's a great one. He's so funny, you know. Yeah. What I mean? And he was a really, he was a good guy, but he always, he was like that in person too. He was really funny and like just slightly, just he'd throw it, like you, like, you know, you're waiting for him to say one thing and he says something a little bit off and just laugh. Oh, I've tried so hard to become friends with Jack Handy and failed in every way. Really? Uh, yeah, well, I used to go, I was promoting my TV show back in 2013 and I would take time. I would be like, and by the way, I want to promote this book. He had written a novel and I would promote his novel on late night talk shows. <laughs> And, he, and his publicist would be like, thank you, no one does this. Uh, <laughs> and he would email me and I'd be like, that's great if I'm ever in you know, where you live, I'd love to grab lunch. And it was just like, no, uh, <laughs> I'm here living my life. I'd go, I'm like, you know what, if I go on The Tonight Show and do it again, he's got to meet with me. No. He would send me things. He's been very nice, but wants no sort of relationship. Right, that's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> now, just back to your personality, you know what I mean? Like, you're very rebellious in a very, in a very uh, orderly way. You know what I'm saying? Like, every comedian has a bit of that streak in them. Sure. But you, it's almost like you're rebelling against even that by just keeping it very organized and precise. I think, uh, I would even say I'm not a rebel as much as I'm a questioner. Right. That I don't just say fuck you for the sake of saying fuck you. Right. But I say fuck you a lot. But it's when I just, like, this doesn't make sense to me. Right. I don't understand why, I understand why you'd ask other people to do this, but not me. I'm not going to do it. I'm also not going to get mad. And I'm not going to become self-destructive, as I've seen a lot of comics do, who are rebellious, and it gets in their own way. Sure. I thought, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be as rebellious as I can be, but I'm also going to be as successful as I can be. Yeah, well, it's a good thing you didn't stick with being a writer on a late night show. You would have been fired from everyone by now. I thought. When I got the job, immediately I was like, this was a mistake. Um, loved everyone there. They loved me. They knew I was funny. But it was clear that the tone was wrong. As a comedian, when you're writing for someone, you write, this is like, I would, I would say this joke. I hope you like it. If you're a comedy writer, it's like, what's your voice? I'm going to capture it. Right, so I right. was writing my jokes, and yeah. Jimmy couldn't do any of them. But I thought, sure. if I quit and I leave, People are going to ask me about this in every interview I do. Like, what happened at Fallon? Right. So I waited literally a year to the day and then left. And no one could give a flying fuck how long I was there. Like, it did not matter at all. And when you went on the road, were you, do, were you headlining at this, by this time, or were you just middling? I was, I was a middle act before I got the Fallon job. And then the Fallon job kept me from being able to do that. And then, like, literally the day I quit, I signed with an agent and started doing, I started headlining my own shows. And I, I meet with this agent, uh, Mike Berkowitz. We meet, like, I'm at lunch at 30 Rock. I'm like, I'm quitting this job in two weeks. Like, can you help me? He's like, yes, as a headliner, I've already got the gigs for you. The next day, I get a list of, like, 20 dates, all these colleges. That's Berkowitz, yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is amazing. My life is different. I go to the first gig. It's a packed house. It's, a, it's College Humor is doing this tour, and I'm on all these College Humor dates. And the crowd's going nuts. College Humor guys come out and do a sketch, and they're like, are you ready for your comedian? And everyone's like, yeah! <laughs> and they go, all right. Well, Aziz Ansari had to cancel. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got another really funny guy, Anthony Jeselnik. And I realized what Berkowitz represented Aziz. <laughs> Aziz had to bail on all these gigs. <laughs> and he slotted me into every one and didn't tell anyone. Like, I would walk around and it's posters of Aziz, like, hanging out. <laughs> I thought it was just everyone who attended this college was Indian, but no. <laughs> They're all just here to see a different comedian. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. But they went good anyway? 
They went fine. I mean, it, w it was a shock, but I got the check, and I was just happy to be a headliner. You know, like, moving up from feature act to headliner was such a huge deal to me. Of course. And I remember not, I, th uh, there are feature acts who are happy being feature acts their whole life. They're happy they don't have to deal with the check drop. They're happy they don't have to deal with, you know, like, uh, with the crowd getting too drunk. It's like you're in the middle of the sweet spot. And I hated that. I wanted to be the man right away. And I remember opening for Doug Benson and uh, seeing his paycheck one day, like in the office. And I'm like, oh, that's how much you make if you're a headliner. And w uh, after about a year of headlining, I'm making that much money. And I just thought, I'm at the top of the game. Right. This is as much as you can make. And I didn't know about door deals. I didn't know there were bigger venues. Like, they were like, no, you're not making anything yet. Right. Uh, you, need to, uh, you need to keep on, uh, keep moving up. Yeah, yeah. And did you have a group of friends that you came up with in comedy? Like, was there a little group that, well, late night at the cellar, you know? A little bit, you, you guys know. guys had to sit at that side table while we sat at the big table? Well, the cellar, <laughs> the cellar wasn't very friendly to alternative comedy, you know? And right. I, I kind of, I kind of uh, bridged that gap, where I did a lot of shows at UCB and then the comedy cellar as well. So the people I hung out with at the cellar, I would not hang out with in other places. I would say my contemporaries in New York were guys like Kumail Nagiani, uh, John Mulaney, T.J. Miller, uh, Pete Holmes, uh, all people I, I do not speak to anymore. Um, and then as you become a headliner, you don't see people anymore. You know, everyone's off on tour somewhere else. You only see them at a festival or something. So y your best friends in comedy, you end up seeing less than anyone else. Yeah. You know, as, as you get more successful. I know, well, that's the whole thing. It's like, you know, greed overtakes friendship. And you're like, I'm not going on the road with them and split the money. Yeah, when they're like, <laughs> When they're like, well, we should tour together, I'm like, you want half my money? No. <laughs> yeah. No, you're not doing I just that. always go, yeah, we should. <laughs> um, <laughs> what about, uh, now here, I'll ask you my question. Do, are you worried, not living in New York, that you're going to lose your humor? No. I'm um, worried. No, I, uh, I'm lucky enough that, you know, and I live in L.A. It's not like I'm living in, in like Milwaukee somewhere. Yeah, but where L.A. Like, like, but the L.A.'s got the comedy store now. When yeah, I started in L.A., it was open mics, Largo. There were a couple places, but the clubs right. weren't it. The comedy cellar was it. Right. And I really uh, cut my teeth there. But I found that if you're not paying money to see me, you don't want to see me. Like I was, it got to the point where I've been coming up at the cellar and people are like booing me waiting for someone else to come on stage. And I'm like, I don't at like this At the cellar? Much. Mm hmm yeah. At booing you? Booing me. Booing me. Yeah, I have some, I have some controversial jokes. That people just weren't enjoying it, that I'm like, why am I putting you through this? That in LA now I have the comedy store I can go to, and it's similar to the cellar. And then I have Largo, which is really the best because it's like Anthony Jesselnik and Friends. Everyone who's bought a ticket is coming strictly to see me and then put up with whoever I trot on stage but before. You know. Uh, so I, so I, don't, I don't think that uh, living in L.A. hurts me uh, comedically. But I also, but, I, I did three years here where I felt like... But uh, you just the revealed word. the difference. In L.A., they're not booing you. In the, New York, they're booing you. And that's good for your comedy. They're not, boo they're not booing me in L.A., but they're not as excited. You know what I mean? If, I'm, right. if it's a, a show with me, Chris D'Elia, Joe Rogan, there's a lot of Rogan and D'Elia fans in that audience. You know, right. we're there to see them. Right. Not so much for me, but if it's just me, Everyone's there for. Oh, yeah, the store just changed completely. Them. The store was like this crazy place for years that nobody cared about. Yeah. Oh yeah. It just turned transferred completely. Yeah. It's I been wonder great. why. You know, I don't know. I don't know if it was performer dependent on like they just started getting a, a different class of comedians or the other clubs just but started to suffer. But the energy changed because I remember in the '90s, first of all, in the '80s it was like this weird energy. Then in the '90s it was like gangs. They used to have gang Monday night. It was like gang night. Mm -hmm. It was like violent. And then suddenly, you know, you just dismissed it, and then suddenly it's this renaissance, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, when I was first moved to L.A., the improv was kind of the place to be. Yeah. The store was the last place you That's went. That's right. And the store, all the comics were kind of the same as each other. Right. I mean, like that whole vibe. Right. And then the Laugh Factory was like Dane Cook's kingdom. Right. That I wouldn't step foot in there. <laughs> um, so you really were limited, and now it's, it's the store, and then everything else is a distant second, which is interesting. And you still, like... Are you thinking, like, you know, you're doing, oh, let's do with the Comedy Central show. So you're doing this Comedy Central show, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, you're going to have to interview people. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of, uh, that's a different animal for you? A little bit, yeah. Uh, but I, I think that you have my to be character. Nice. You have in, to be, yeah. yeah, and I'm, I'm, I had to get nicer as it went. 
the show, they, they, this, the crew would call it Night King Tonight, like from Game <laughs> of Thrones. Because the interview would start and it's me just staring at Tig Notaro, like, first question. And they're like, you need to put people at ease, Anthony. Uh, but I just thought it was fun to ask funny questions and then get thoughtful answers. And I'm only talking about stand-up comedy with stand-up comics that I already like. Right. You know, I'm not Seth Meyers talking to uh, whoever they put in front of them that night. Right. You know, it's like, these have got to be my friends, which is why I think we got maybe 10 episodes left before I run out <laughs> and, uh, and we got to do something else. And what about, does everyone talk about, like, the, like the, the most interesting things to me still is, like, the worst bombs. Like, the worst bomb stories. I think people get that a lot, that I'm more interested in, like, we would do a segment called Agree or Disagree. And I'm talking to Kristen Shaw. And I say, agree or disagree, all comedy comes from surprise. And she says, I disagree. I'm like, why? I'm surprised at that. Like, I'm, why, do, why do you disagree? And she's like, well, a lot of my humor comes from the commitment to the bit. You know, she's, whereas I'm like, set up punchline. The, the punchline is a surprise. Kristen's thing is like, I'm singing the song about being a horse for 10 straight minutes. And I'm like, yes, but the surprise is the commitment. Right. The surprise is that you have not stopped doing this. <laughs> So it keeps getting funnier. And she emailed me the other day to be like, I still keep thinking about that. Like, I'm like, you I've been doing comedy for 15, 20 years, and you've changed the way I think about my own act, that I think that is fascinating. I'd rather discuss that than what's your worst bomb? What, uh, when did you know you were funny? Like, we ask those questions almo almost sarcastically. Yeah. You, know? you mean like I asked you? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I mean, but I love it, because I feel like, speaking of changing your act, I feel like bombing is such an important part of comedy as far as it te what it teaches you. Like, even today, like you say, you'll go on with Chris Leo or Joe, and you've got to work differently that you can't just go up and coast no matter what. No. Because the audience will always just be like, we're not buying this right now. And then you got to, you have to change your, almost your DNA on the spot. Yeah, but every bomb for me is the same in that I do not have a plan B. No. That if it's like, if the first joke doesn't hit, this is going to be a tough hour. <laughs> <laughs> but let's bomb, and there's nothing I can do about it. Like, Tig Notaro told a story about go, Billy bombing in Florida and just laughing and being like, you guys don't think it's funny that I flew here <laughs> and that you bought tickets so you could hate me? And by the end, she's turned it all around, but I can't do that. Right, you know, I have right, to right. just be like, here's another joke you're going to fucking hate. <laughs> but what I was saying was, in the special, there's these moments, there's three or four moments where you're kind of just playing with the crowd. There's, mm -hmm. there's more than three or four. Sure. There's three or four where you're kind of like, you know, it's, I hate to say, you're very warm. And uh, you know what I mean? Like, there's just a, a, a break, there's a different energy going on, but it's really, it's great. But I feel like you could do that. Anytime. Do you mean when I'm like yelling at the crowd for not laughing hard enough? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. Those are like, I mean, that's designed. I just think it's funny to do that as a performer, to chastise the crowd for not giving you. Yeah, but it also brings, more. I feel like it's a connection with them. You know what I mean? Mm hmm And I think if you're already laughing, like part of my philosophy is that if I was in the audience and I'm laughing at a comic and the person next to me hates this comedian so much, it would make me enjoy the comedian more. <laughs> like I would be like, I feel special because I get this and these other people don't, that I don't mind that at all. <laughs> Because I could see you doing a, almost a whole hour. I was almost watching, even though you're doing this, like, you know, your act, but I could almost see you doing, like, an hour of crowd work, only the way with your particular oh, yeah. strong I mean, personality. It was funny. I did, I did a special called Thoughts and Prayers that I, uh, a couple years ago that I taped, and... <laughs> I get it, you're fans. Uh, and I taped it in San Francisco, and afterwards, the special gets released, and everyone's like, wow, it was such a cool choice that you show audience reaction shots where everyone's uncomfortable. And I was like, I would have loved to have shown people laughing. <laughs> that was not by design. It's just what happened that night. And people are like, wow, it was a brave choice. It was like, no, I, it, was, it was a bad crowd. <laughs> so now what about, um when you take your you take yourself as a comedian, so you're young, like what would you want to do if you start moving into like let's say shows, other stuff besides stand up? Like how would you execute 
like a show without being, unless it's like just like offensive, mm -hmm. great show. Thank you. But I mean, it was a great show, but it's also like you're, you have to do things that go that in that direction. Yeah, it, you kind of get locked into a box, which is why this new show, Good Talk, it was like, get me out of it. Right. Now it's just me talking to a friend. So you're gonna see a different side, but the personality is still there. The sense of humor is still there. But I'm at the point now, you, you say I'm young, I'm 40 years old, that I only wanna do the things that I get to do. You know, I wouldn't have signed a deal with Comedy Central if, if, they didn't, if, if, if I needed the deal. Do you know what I mean? It was like, right. I get to do this, and if you cancel it, okay, I'm still cool. But I don't like I don't have to bend over backwards the way I did on the Jess on the offensive to keep that show on the air for all 18 episodes. <laughs> but I mean, would you do want to do like like I mean, it doesn't almost doesn't lend itself what you're doing doesn't lend itself to being like a you know a TV show. But you seem like it. You seem like you'd be a good actor. Have you studied acting? Thank you. Um, I used to, when I was like in college and high school, I was a good actor. Like I'd be like the, the good person in the class. I think that stand-up has made me a much worse actor. Yeah, I think the fact you said you studied in high school lets us all know you need to get. <laughs> I took an elective. You need to get but back I was to William. Really, but I was, for but I was good. Quickly. Um, but I. I was an acting music man for Christ's sake. <laughs> <laughs> acting is listening. And as, stand -up, as a stand-up comic, you are never listening no, to anyone. No, it's the exact opposite. Exactly. So if we, you and I are in a scene together, right. you're talking, I'm just thinking about me. You yeah. Know? And that makes me a bad actor. But yeah. if someone is like, I've got this part, I think you'd be perfect for it, I'll show up and I'll shoot it and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll do a good job. Right. But if you want me to audition, get the fuck out of here. No, I know. Like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Well, that's just, I feel like that's a temperament of most successful stand-ups, is just, it's, you just hate anybody telling you what to do. You hate anybody else giving their opinion and being in charge of anything you say. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to go into stand-up. You know what I mean? It's like you can't, you can't tolerate any, anybody, any boss. No, and you can't stand the preparation either, I think. The, the way you have to prepare to be a good actor or a great actor is something that stand-ups just don't do. I mean, you're always writing, but you look at a set list before you go out, you might throw it in the stool, and then you're like, we'll get through this somehow. Even if it's a bad crowd, I know how to deal with crowds, I can talk to people. As with an audition, you're like, I gotta memorize this for 10 minutes, yeah. and then they're gonna give it to someone who cares. Like, I don't I, want, uh, I, I don't like uh, acting that much. Like, I just don't, I don't respect it as an art form. <laughs> but it's also the, the excitement level of acting is so much lower. You're sitting in a trailer or whatever. The trailer is the worst. You're so used to stand up as like live crowds mm -hmm. that we're kind of spoiled in the sense that we don't want to sit there and just go, hey, and have, one person go, hey, that was good, that moment we had. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I'd rather hear people either laughing or, or yeah. some other large reaction, yeah, bad stand, or good. Stand up is the show's at 8, I'll see you at 7.30. You know, yeah. acting is like, your scene's at noon, we'll see you at 4 a.m. for makeup, and you're like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. this doesn't make any sense. Uh, and for a fraction of the money I get from the stage, great, I'll yeah. see you there. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's also, I think, I feel like there's no, there's, no, there's less on the line. There's too little on the line as far as I hate to bring up, I keep bringing up bombing, but it's an important part of it because bombing is what, like the tension when you go out on stage is that it could go badly. Mm -hmm. Each joke you tell, it's silent. And then is it going to get a laugh? And so there's none of that in, in, in acting. No, it's very sterile. It's a very sterile environment yeah. and there's no danger. Whatsoever. There's no danger. It's just like whatever the director's mood is, is what you're dealing with that day. Whereas a live audience, you have no idea. Yeah. No idea. I mean, I wonder about a guy like, a guy like you, what would have become of you if we weren't a stand-up comic? I can't, even, I can't even think, you know what I mean? Like, what kind of a job would, you would not be getting fired from? Or, you know? I would get, honestly, I think I would just keep getting fired from jobs. Yeah. Like, I think I would just keep, because I just, I always got fired from jobs. I think Fallon's the only job I've ever quit. Um, and I was, it was like, I was a bad employee. I would start out good and then be like, I shouldn't be doing this. There's something else out there for me. You I'm could too be, funny, a, I'm too clever. Yeah. Uh, I don't need to be doing this. You could be a really uh, snotty waiter. I don't think I could even be a waiter. I, I think you'd be a good stuff. waiter. You've got the bearing and you could look nice in a white shirt like this, black pants, black shoes like I'm wearing. Maybe, and a tie. maybe a maitre d'. <laughs> 
<laughs> there, I remember looking through the book when I was a kid. I don't see your name. There's a chain. There's a chain restaurant that I discovered when I was a kid called Dick's Last Resort. And it's at like Myrtle Beach and all places like that. And like the point of the restaurant is that everyone who works there is a dick to you. And I, I, my, my friends took me there when I was in eighth grade and I was like, one day this will all be mine. <laughs> like, this is somewhere that I could shine. Uh, I would be a star here. Yeah, they had a place like that in Brooklyn when I was growing up. Literally one of those places that was known, it was called Warm Beer and Lousy Food. Mm -hmm. And that was the motto on the back of the shirts. And I went there with my girlfriend, I was like 17, but I thought I was funny already. And I'm drunk, and the guys, literally, you, they bust your balls, you're supposed to take it, and I'm trying to hit them back. They took me in the back, gave me a little tune-up. <laughs> <laughs> and kicked us out. <laughs> Sounds like a fun day. Crazy Country Club, that's what it was called, Crazy Country Club. That's great. Yeah, you don't want to be given it back. No. <laughs> they don't like that. Yeah. But like, I mean, I'll do shows where somebody is in the audience, like, Justin's going to love this. I'm going to yell something out. <laughs> no, I do not. I don't ever. You guys are writing down questions. I'm pissed about that. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a certain rhythm to your thing, too. It's got to be, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's got to be listened to correctly. You know what I mean? Even when I was watching a special, I was like, I hope nobody starts yelling out. And there was one moment where somebody went, yeah, after one joke, and that pissed me off. Yeah. You know? I get annoyed. It's, it's like just got to, you know what I mean? It's got to be. A pristine. Certain people don't, certain people do. I would just never act that way in an audience that I can't understand people who do. You know, no matter, and I, listen, I get drunk as fuck. <laughs> but I've never once yelled out during a show. Like, I just don't, I don't think that's an excuse, and I just can't understand the behavior that it drives me crazy. Do you think being good looking uh, worked against you or for you? Like, if you were ugly. I think it's. Just imagine you as ugly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's the first question. Um, I think, it, I think it, it, it helped form my persona. Because as a 23-year-old looking like this, people hated me right away. And so I was like, let's lean into that. And I would say Calm the, down. the graveyard, <laughs> the graveyard of failed comedians is filled with much prettier corpses than mine. You know what I mean? It's not like being good looking helps in any way. It just kind of informed the kind of the character that I had to be. Right. And then once I got to a certain level, it really helped because most comedians are fucking dogs. <laughs> Present and company excluded. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. The, um, yeah, but I mean, it also, it, it is one of those things where one of the most annoying things in comedy to me, among the many, is when people pretend to be ugly if they're good looking. Yes. I always hated that. I never did that. I was never like, it's so hard to date. Not for me. <laughs> you know? And I'll tell you this, I'll tell you being good looking. <laughs> I'll tell you this. Being good looking <laughs> got me past at the comedy cellar much quicker than it would have. SD has got a soft spot yes. for, the, uh, for the cute ones. Yeah. Well, as I, like you said, few and far between. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You what, know? Do you, what do you got there? I got a couple of questions. First of all, this is good hand. They're all in different hand. Oh, you guys wrote your own handwriting. <laughs> all right, I'm going to read. You wrote your own handwriting. <laughs> what a gifted audience we have tonight. <laughs> OK, the first one is, do you like to watch other comedians, or, it is, distract or it, is it distracting from your own comedy writing? And then part two, first answer that. Uh, I try not to when I'm in the middle of, of my hour, you know, when I'm, like, when I'm there, because I don't want to see something that's gonna bump me. Like I know Louis C.K. had an abortion joke in his special 2017, so I was just like, I refused to watch it. And Chris Rock was like, no, it's completely different from yours, but I still don't even want that in my head. But when I'm in a place where I am now, where I go home, I fly home tonight, right. and I start writing the next hour, now that this is all fucking done. Um, <laughs> and I'll watch a ton of stand-up. Yes. I'll watch everything I can, just because I think, what would I do? You know, it's an, I don't always enjoy it. The but people who are much more different. Yeah, it's inspirational. And there are people who are so different from me yeah. that I can really enjoy that. But you've got to be completely different. I yeah. can't enjoy a one-liner guy. I can't enjoy a dark comedian. But a guy like Nate Bargatze, uh, a guy like, um, oh, fuck, Ryan Hamilton. I can watch those guys all day. And I'm like, nothing's going to bump with me. I can get inspiration from this. But I, I truly love comedy. And one of the hardest parts about being in it now for 17 years is you have to stop watching people. 
You know, I watched David Tell every night at the cellar. Right. And I started acting like fucking David Tell. Right. And I went to Esty, at the, who runs the comedy cellar, and I'm like almost confessed. I was like, I have to stop watching David Tell. And it seemed like it was like a, a comic's right of a, a passage to watch every David Tell set. And she goes, good, more comics should stop watching David Tell. You can see the comics in New York who've watched too much David Tell, but that, that, That's right. uh, yeah, that for a while, everybody was, had a little bit of a tell. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's just too fun not to do. Yeah. You know, I, people will do it with me. My opener at the beginning of the weekend, by the end of the weekend, they're like, that's a great joke. And I'm like, dickhead, that's my thing. <laughs> yes. I know it's fun to say. I know but stop it is. It. Yeah. You see, it's always by people, you know? Yeah. All right. What's, what's part two here? Part two, you answered. Who do you like to watch? Okay. Nate Bugatti and Ryan Hamilton. Now listen. Um, What's your most controversial joke? Hmm. I'll answer that. There was a couple of really funny ones that were in the special. I wouldn't want to ruin them again. I mean, I have an answer that's not from the special. Fine. But if you want to throw out what you think were the most controversial jokes. Yeah, I'm only Colin Quinn. Um, <laughs> this, he, thinks he's on, he thinks he's on a regular talk show, right? Yeah. Um, I think the, the white supremacist run is really, it's so interesting because it starts a certain way. I'm like, oh, and then you just brought it. It's, funny. it's, so funny. it's really, fun. it's just funny. You know what I mean? I don't even consider it controversial, but I'm saying I could see in today's climate, people would be like, well, I don't know if you should joke about such things. There was some tension there for sure. I remember uh, with my crowd, they were into it. Uh, but I remember opening for Chris Rock in St. Louis. <laughs> and, <laughs> and literally, I remember doing a setup. <laughs> and a woman goes, fuck you. <laughs> and being like, you got to let me finish the joke, otherwise I'm in some trouble. Like, I've had that <laughs> yeah. happen before. You got to let me finish. But I was doing, I was in Montreal years ago doing the Nasty Show. Hey. And it, we're there for weeks, you know, before the festival even starts, it's just locals coming. And there's a large uh, uh, Hasidic Jewish population and they love dirty jokes. They, 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 they really come and they, they love that. I don't have anything about sex really, but I've got controversial, upsetting jokes. Right. And I had this joke about my mom. You have the kind of look I may say they probably don't appreciate. Yes, yes, yeah. That's why you're popular, why you're popular in Poland. Yeah. I look like a lot of people in history books. <laughs> um, and I had a joke about my mom being a Holocaust denier when I was a kid. And already the crowd's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> we thought we were going to hear jokes about pussy. We didn't think this was coming. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, it's, like, it's rabbis in the audience. <laughs> and the joke was, uh, I, we were ashamed of her that she was a Holocaust denier. So we had a rabbi come to the house, explain the history of the Jewish people. We made her watch Schindler's List, and now she's done a complete 180. Uh, now she can't believe it only happened once. <laughs> and literally the head rabbi of Montreal was like, I'm going to the newspapers and I'm going to ruin this guy's career. I'm going to say he's anti-Semitic. Uh, and I'm like, that's great press. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, and Jeff Ross just kept going, why does it have to be your mother? <laughs> if it wasn't your mother, it would, you could change a joke. And I'm like, it's got to be my mom. You got to meet my mom. Yeah, yeah that was one. That's I, so I just funny. remember that joke always coming back to haunt me and being like, you don't see what I'm doing here? Like, well, you don't see that twist? <laughs> I once worked with Jeff Ross at an old Jewish thing right after, and he silenced the crowd, but he, the other way, which right after the Mel Gibson thing, and he goes, yeah, but he's upset that, you know, the Jews killed Jesus. He goes, that's right, we killed him, and if he comes back, we'll fucking do it again. <laughs> oh, do you see yourself starring in movies? Possibly. I mean, I, if someone, like, I, uh, so who was the guy? Um, owner of the Giants. Um, Wellington Mara? No, the other one. Steve Tisch. Steve Tisch is like, I saw the special Fire in the Maternity Ward. I, w I want to meet Anthony. And I was like, yeah, let's have lunch. Like, this is great. He's won Oscars for movies. He's done different things. And, I, and he was like, would you be in a movie? And I was like, yeah. 
if Steve Tisch was like, I've got this movie, I want you to star in it, I'm gonna star in it. But am I gonna go through the process at all? Yeah. No. And then he was like, well, what about, like, I, do, I produced American History X. Would you play like, a, like, a, like, a, like an intense kind of skinhead guy? And I'm like, would I have been in the movie you made 20 years ago? Yes, yeah, Steve. <laughs> I don't know how this helps. But yeah, I'll do things. I'm just only willing to put so much effort into them. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I would love to star in a movie someday. Maybe you could play uh, Eli Manning. Yo, hmm. your stand-up persona can be ruthless. Has he ever shown up in your everyday life? Has he? Oh, I like that. Has he ever shown up in your everyday life? Like, have I ever been in like a real life situation where I'm like, like, because I think of the persona almost as like, uh, like an Iron Man costume. You know what I mean? Like, when I put it on, I can shoot lasers and shit. But when I take it off, I'm just a just a really brilliant guy. Um, <laughs> but I was I was traveling recently. I was getting off a plane, and there was a guy in the seat in front of me, and his bag was like back two rows. And I'm getting off the plane, I'm kind of groggy, and he's like, will you just stay in your seat until I get my bag, but I stood up anyway. And he reaches past me and grabs the bag and goes, and goes could have been a lot easier. <laughs> and I go, it was still pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> and you can like feel the tension, and he turns around and looks at me, and I just went, you don't know who I am. <laughs> Turn around and get off the plane. <laughs> and he did, I didn't have to go into that mode. I don't know what, that, what, what I would have done if he had been like, no, we're gonna fight right here. But I still like, it's in the back of my head what I can do. <laughs> but wait a minute. What a, I mean, there's no way he thought, oh, this guy's gonna, uh, his rapier-like wit is gonna tear me to shreds. <laughs> he, thought, he thought you were planning to have a fight. I don't know what he thought. It doesn't matter, but, but I'm like, if we, get a verbal, if we get in a verbal sparring contest, I can take you apart. Right, like, but that's people, not what he was thinking. There are people, I remember Bobby Kelly said to me, he says, you look at me like you've thought of the worst insult possible, and you're just choosing not to say it. <laughs> that I think that's like my resting that's face. Great. Like I have a resting bitch face. I was in line at the Starbucks, <laughs> and a woman once turned around and goes, excuse me, oh. <laughs> And I was like, what is the look on my face right now while I'm waiting to order coffee? Uh, uh, all right. What is the weirdest place you've ever thought of a joke? That's a sick question. Mm. <laughs> I know, I've definitely thought of jokes in bed, never like in the act, but I've been like in bed and been like, I've got to get up and write this down. Um, I wouldn't even say it's weird, but a lot of my best jokes I get in the car from my, uh, from my condo to the comedy store. Like, I'm thinking about a bit, and I think of an extra little thing to add in. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But because I've sat down at a computer for an hour that right. day and written, my brain is working in that way. But so then what do you put on your phone? I try to remember it and maybe jot it down when I get there. I email myself jokes a lot. I don't have, like, a file because then I, I forget about it. I know. Uh, cool. But I email myself so I have to see it later on. Now, here's the last question, but it's really sick, the way he wrote this question. He says, what topic will you not tell jokes about? Puts his name, Paul, and then look, other than yourselves. Are you trying to say we won't joke about ourselves, Paul? I've honestly never told a self-deprecating joke in my life. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I mean, I think it's funny, but I also, I just think it's more difficult to not do that. Like, I used to get in trouble opening for Doug Benson because we'd go to, like, Dayton, Ohio. And I would spend my first 10 minutes shitting on Dayton, Ohio. And Doug would be like, Anthony, if you just picked the town next door, this would go over so much better. <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, but it's harder, and I, so I like that. Of course. But honestly, with the way things go now, like, not to get political at all, but I was, like, pitching TV shows right around the time of the election. And if Hillary had won, I could have really leaned into the villain persona and done a, 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 done a show that was almost like right. if Trump had a TV show. Right. But once Trump won, it was like, no, you don't want to be on that. I can't be on that side. It almost ruins the joke because it's too real. Um, that I had a joke in my act that uh, was very short. And one of those jokes that will get quoted a lot. And the joke was, uh, why do they call it a hate crime uh, if I love to do it? 
And, <laughs> and then the uh, Pittsburgh synagogue shooting happened. And I just right. thought, you know what, I don't want anyone to even think that I'm on that side. Like, there are people in my audience, probably tonight, who, uh, <laughs> who are not good people and, and think that I'm like on their side. And like, t people will say, like, oh, you joke about the things we're all thinking but can't say. No, I am not. <laughs> and I do not pander to that crowd. They get what I give them, but like at the end of my, uh, the Fire in the Maternity Ward, there's this whole bit about abortion. Right. It's basically I'm taking my friend in a very, like, almost like I'm taking her to get her appendix out, which is clearly a pro-choice bit, and people leave in droves because they're upset like I've betrayed them politically. Uh, so I think there are just some things I stay away from now just because it doesn't interest to me to be on to be on that side, even though I like playing with that side. Right. You know, I like to talk about racism, but I would never use a racial slur. You know, I would never I would never talk about it that way. It's like you really got to find that line. That the way the world is today, I, I'm not I'm not more careful. I'm just I'm just conscious of what I represent. You know, I enjoy being the villain. But I, I keep using the, the example of the show Deadwood. Did you watch the show Deadwood? Did you really I that just show? saw it. Okay. You know, in the beginning of the show, there's a character named Al Swearingen, played by Ian McShane, who is the villain. From the, from the pilot, he's the villain for the first six episodes. And then somebody worse shows up. And you're like, thank God Al Swearingen's here to take care of this guy. I want to be Al Swearingen. <laughs> I want people to be scared of me, but I also want to be able to do good and be the kind of villain that other villains do not want to fuck with. Thank you. Well, I love that. That's a great day. ending, although you ruined Deadwood for me. I told you, I just thought of watching it. Um, <laughs> Anthony Jessel, again, oh, everybody. Please. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you to Colin Quinn. You're my first choice to do this. If someone asked me to do this, I would have told them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> uh, but I really appreciate it. You're one of my Pleasure. favorites. Thank you. Thank you.